Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, Heart Disease Prevention in 2022. What's hot and what's not? It's the perfect topic for this February Heart Month, the month of love and the month to remind you to take care of your hearts. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo. I will be your program moderator for tonight's talk, presented, of course, by U Health Virtual Clinics. We want to remind you that U-Health textbook providers are ready to care for you in our facilities, virtually, wherever you are. And we also invite you to learn more about the measures we have in place to keep you safe. We take it quite seriously, as well as your appointment scheduling options. And all you have to do is visit umiamihealth.org to see how you can book an appointment. Well, tonight, as I say, in honor of February as National Heart Awareness Month, We'll hear from Dr. Carl Oringer speaking on the prevention and management of heart disease. I'm happy to share that you'll be able to participate in a question and answer session at the end of the presentation for you to ask your questions of Dr. Oringer. Though many of you have already submitted questions in advance, there's plenty of time to enter more by using the anonymous Q&A feature. And that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a moment to just locate it on your Zoom screen. So many of us are experts now in Zoom. You probably know where it is, but just take a moment because that's where you're going to be entering the questions and we'll prepare them for Dr. Oringer to address at the end of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Oringer, a nationally known expert in the prevention of cardiovascular disease and the director of the U Health Preventive Cardiovascular Medicine Program and Lipid Clinic. He is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and a past president of the National Lipid Association. Also an associate editor of the European Heart Journal who has authored more than 60 peer reviewed manuscripts. Dr. Oringer is the current author of the American College of Cardiology self-assessment program on lipid management. This is a tool used to instruct cardiologists on the latest advances in cholesterol treatment for heart disease prevention. Pay close attention tonight, folks. We are privileged to welcome Dr. Oringer. Welcome Dr. Oringer and please make sure you unmute so that we can hear all your conversation. Well, thank you so much, Eliana. I appreciate uh, the introduction. And uh, while it's fun for me to uh, teach my colleagues and, and the residents and students who work with me, it's a great privilege to be able to teach uh, our patients. And that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're going to talk about the newest concepts in heart disease prevention in 2022. And I thought the best way to approach it was to focus on what's hot and what's not, because Dr. Oringer, you accidentally uh, muted yourself. There are all kinds of things that people want to know. They want to know what things they're doing actually make sense and can help them, and what things they're doing uh, actually don't make sense. So I'm going to first start out by talking a little bit about um, what's not. Go here, and I am having trouble advancing my slides. So let's see. Here we go. All right. So. Let's start off with what's not hot. And I'm gonna give you a little menu of things we're gonna discuss when we talk about the concept of what's not hot. One of the things that's not hot is aspirin for prevention of a first heart attack or stroke. Another thing that's not hot is the use of beta blocker medicines like metoprolol as the initial drug for blood pressure control. How about over-the-counter fish oil supplements? We use those a lot. Many doctors think that you can use those as substitutes for statins. Uh, and many patients like to take these because they think that it makes them healthier. What about the idea of vitamins for heart attack or cancer prevention? What about the idea of raising HDL cholesterol to reduce heart attack risk or the use of niacin for heart attack prevention? Then there are these supplements that so many of our patients take like coenzyme Q10, red yeast rice, garlic, lecithin. All of these are used because many people feel that that, that, that is going to give them a heads up in terms of preventing heart trouble. But what is hot? 
What's hot is aspirin for the prevention uh, of heart attacks and those with a history of a heart attack or stroke, home blood pressure monitoring or a special technology called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which actually gives us a more accurate idea of what a person's true cardiovascular risk is. What's also hot is the new blood pressure goals that used to be less than 140 over 90. Now we're talking about lowering blood pressure to less than 130 over 80. And we like to focus initially on healthy eating habits, exercise, and the use of medicines for which there is good evidence of benefit. And then another thing that is important that we'll get into is the idea of lowering cholesterol with healthy eating habits and exercise. And then the use of medicines that so many of us know about, the statins, and when are those statins actually needed? And when should a person use more than just a statin to prevent heart attacks? Now we'll get into the really red hot domain of coronary calcium scoring, the earlier use of these new medicines called PCSK9 inhibitors, and an ultra new medicine just, to, just uh, on the market called Inclizoran. Then there are, we're really getting into some new stuff, long acting injectable nucleic acid based therapies. Boy, it sounds like we're going into the future now. And then finally, artificial intelligence to identify people who are unsuspected high cardiac risk. So we've got all these things to talk a little bit about tonight, just to give you a taste of some of the things that uh, I talk about frequently with my patients and also things that I uh, routinely instruct my colleagues on when it comes to prevention. So let's talk for a few minutes about what is not hot. You see this nice uh, picture of aspirin up on the left-hand side of this slide? In fact, aspirin has been used for many years to try to prevent the first heart attack. Uh, and we've begun to learn based upon some recent very large studies that except in certain selected people, in most cases, aspirin is not particularly good to prevent the first heart attack. The, there are exceptions to that, and the exceptions are primarily those who have been shown to have very high coronary calcium scores. But in the absence of that, and a person who's not had a heart attack or a stroke or blocked arteries in the legs, in most cases today, we are not recommending the use of aspirin for heart disease prevention. So you see that beta that's just to the right of the aspirin, that stands for beta blockers. Beta blocker medicines like metoprolol, uh, like atenolol, uh, like uh, Inderol, a number, of, a number of beta blocker medicines that have been commonly used for years for doctors to pr prescribe for people with high blood pressure. We've now recognized that those medicines uh, have a specific role. There are certain times when they should be used, but in the great majority of patients, those are not supposed to be the first line drugs that are used for blood pressure control. There are other medicines that have shown, uh, that have been shown to have better effects on patients' blood pressure and resulting in better control of blood pressure, such as medicines called the angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors, um, the calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. So beta blockers do have a place, but it's usually not right up at the top of the list. A lot of people like to take a multivitamin because they believe that that reduces their risk of heart attack or stroke, whereas in fact, there's no good evidence today that the multivitamins provide that benefit. So the vast majority of people uh, are taking multivitamins and are, and are actually producing very expensive urine, but not providing much benefit to their bodies. I see people all the time who come in and say, I want to take something natural, so I'm going to take some lecithin or garlic. Both of these are frequently used uh, by people who uh, feel that they don't want to take prescription medications, uh, whereas in fact, the benefit that's associated with, with either of these two has not been demonstrated. Uh, at most, garlic can lower your LDL cholesterol by at most 4%, which is trivial and probably of no clinical benefit in terms of reduce, reduction of cardiac risk. On the other part of this slide, we see these beautiful looking uh, capsules containing fish oil. And I see so many patients coming into me today uh, on fish oil capsules or that they've chosen to take on their own or their doctors have prescribed it for them, the non-prescription fish oils. And uh, the, the idea that these benefit patients is very, very minimal. Uh, and in fact, the only types of fish oil capsules that have been shown to benefit people 
are a certain type of prescription fish oil, um, which is called icosapendethyl, that was shown in a large study of high risk people to reduce their risk if they're taking proper medicines on top of it. So again, the benefits of fish oil capsules uh, are quite limited. Although I will point out that even two servings uh, a week of fresh ocean fish has been associated with reduced cardiovascular risk. Well, some people say, I really don't wanna take any of those statin medicines, but I'd really like to take this red yeast rice because this, this is a natural product that can lower my cardiac risk. In fact, red yeast rice is a fungus that grows on a particular type of rice in one province of China. And uh, these are encapsulated and they're sent uh, all over the world for people to take them. And in fact, this fungus does produce a type of a statin. There's a statin in red yeast rice that is so-called naturally occurring. And when taken in a dose of four capsules a day can produce a mild amount of cholesterol reduction in the range of 10 or 12%, and in some people as much as 15%. But we do not recommend red yeast rice because red yeast rice is not an FDA approved product. And in fact, uh, there have been impurities in certain batches of red yeast rice that have caused toxicity to the kidneys. And it's especially worrisome when a person comes in taking red yeast rice on top of a statin because there have been cases of severe kidney injury when that occurs. So in general, if you wanna take a statin, I prefer that you take a uh, prescription statin, even if you wanna take it in the same dose as you would get in red yeast rice, at least it's uh, FDA evaluated and approved. And the cost in fact is actually less to you to take the same dose of statin that you would get in red yeast rice. Coenzyme Q10 uh, is, a, is a, a product that many people take because they feel that it's going to reduce the likelihood of getting muscle associated side effects from statins. When we wrote the cholesterol guidelines that we published in 2018 uh, by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, we looked very carefully at the evidence for coenzyme Q10 and could find no evidence of benefit. Similarly, niacin, which has been used for many years, uh, has actually been shown in several studies, uh, particularly in those patients who are taking good doses of statins, not to provide any significant cardiovascular benefit. And in fact, there are some harms associated with it. So we do not recommend the use of niacin um, or even nicotinamide, um, which is a bound form of niacin that, that does not have any effect on blood cholesterol uh, or HDL or LDL values but the only value for nicotinamide, which is a bound, bound form of niacin, is that it does reduce the likelihood of actinic keratoses, which are uh, precancerous lesions on the skin. Well, now let's get to what's really hot. So first of all, we're back in aspirin again, but now we see aspirin up in the left-hand corner that it's hot and it's hot for people who have, who have had a heart attack or who have a stent or have had bypass surgery or for people who have had uh, a stroke. You can see that picture of that, that patient on, in the upper left-hand corner it was, was a patient who has a drooping um, mouth on the right side because uh, he suffered a stroke. Uh, people who have blocked arteries in the legs, peripheral arterial disease. Aspirin is terrifically beneficial in those people. 81 milligrams, one tablet a day, very low likelihood of any gastrointestinal side effects but great benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk. As I mentioned before, this new blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80 has been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk more than having a blood pressure of 140 over 90. In most, uh, most of our guidelines uh, uh, that have been produced since the 2017 hypertension guideline have advocated a lower blood pressure goal of 130 over 80 uh, in most patients, although again, the, the exact level of blood pressure has to be uh, decided upon in, in conjunction with your physician. Sometimes we allow it to be a little bit higher, especially in some older patients. But again, that's a personal decision that needs to be made between the clinician and uh, the patient. Now, as we move up toward the right hand side of the screen, you can see this uh, blood pressure monitor. This is a monitor that measures your blood pressure. You this, you have this cuff here and you basically open up the cuff and slip your arm through the cuff. And then once you're seated in a hardback chair with your feet flat on the floor, 
You wait five minutes, press the button, and see what your blood pressure reading is. And we usually recommend doing it three times, throwing away the first reading. And these are what our guidelines tell us to do in terms of home blood pressure measurement. That's the proper technique to use to accurately, accurately assess your blood pressure. And in fact, we think that there's more evidence that home blood pressures properly done provide us much more information than you get when you just go to your doctor's office, the blood pressure cuff is slapped onto your arm and you're told that your blood pressure is high. By the way, that X over the uh, blood pressure monitor here is a wrist blood pressure monitor. It seems that, that those who put the blood pressure monitors on the wrist are not getting as accurate reading as those who put it on the arm. And for that reason, we recommend against wrist blood pressure monitors and recommend for the home blood pressure monitors that are for the arm, for the upper arm. Of course, I don't wanna minimize, and in fact, I wanna maximize the importance of healthy eating. So fresh fruits and vegetables, whole cereal grains, um, fresh ocean fish, low fat dairy products, legumes, staying away from processed foods, simple carbohydrates, um, things that you know, the, the processed candies and sweets and sugars, not to say you can't ever have any of that stuff. It simply means that that should not be a major part of your diet. You should have those more as treats rather than having them as what you live on. And certainly this is not, this over here is not consistent with eating at a fast food restaurant. So again, I'm not telling you never to do it. What I'm telling you is you should minimize it. What we've begun to recognize in terms of helping people with their diets is that we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. So we want you to understand what you should do the great majority of the time, recognizing that there will be times when you're at a party, when you're in a celebration of some type, where the, when the greatest food of all will not be available. So again, when you're there, indulge, but indulge in small amounts and then get back to your good eating habits after that. Physical activity plays a big role in reducing cardiovascular risk. Uh, there's been lots of discussion about the regular value of physical activity to maintain weight about 130 minutes, I'm sorry, 150 minutes a week, that's 30 minutes five times a week. And if you wanna lose weight, 200 minutes a week. That, that may sound impossible to many of you uh, because of obligations you have in your work or, or with your kids, or even, in a, even if you live in a place where you don't feel particularly safe walking around. But the, re the real thing to remember is there's no absolute in terms of exercise. So the more you do, the better off you are. And even if you park further away, even if you take as many steps as you can during the day, even if you don't sit as often, I mean, sitting itself for long periods of time has adverse health effects. So again, physical activity in general, the more you do, the better off you are. And it does definitely reduce cardiovascular risk. On the bottom of this screen, the other things that are hot are, of course, our, our um, statin medicine. They have been clearly shown to reduce cardiovascular risk. We'll talk about them in a minute. Ezetimibe, which is, a, which is a, uh, another generic medication that can help to magnify the benefits of a statin in terms of further lowering the bad cholesterol, the LDL. And then this, new, this newer category of drugs called PCS canine inhibitors, which have associated with them very marked abilities to lower cholesterol and to reduce heart attack risk. Now let's talk for a minute about statins because these are questions that I'm constantly getting from patients about how much, you know, is statin really gonna benefit me um, and why should I take it? One of the key points I wanna, I wanna emphasize to you is that the reason your physician or your healthcare provider provides a, provides a prescription for you for a statin is not to lower your cholesterol. It lowers cholesterol, but that's not the reason we give it. We give it because it reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke. So if your goal is to reduce your risk of a stroke, or if your goal is to reduce your risk of a heart attack, statins in the appropriate patients can make a big, big difference. So again, remember the purpose of a statin is to reduce heart attack and stroke. That's why your healthcare provider gives you a prescription for a statin. People always have questions about, well, what if I just take a little bit versus if I take higher doses? And it's interesting to point out that we oftentimes make a decision about how much statin we should give a person dependent upon their risk. Like a person who's had a recent heart attack or has had a stent or, or uh, has, has 
uh, come into the hospital um, in, a, in a situation where they, they have an active, active evidence of heart disease, we typically use higher doses of statins because there is evidence that higher doses provide the greatest risk. But in certain cases, we can get by with moderate doses of statins that can also provide a lot of benefit to the patient. So we're, we're always trying to determine what the best dose for a patient is, but I wanna point out to you that the highest doses have been shown to provide the greatest benefit. Many people are worried about muscle-related side effects from statins, and, and statin-associated muscle symptoms typically are described as occurring on both sides of the body, not just on one side, and in the large muscles of the upper legs, as well as in the large muscles of the upper arms. These tend to occur within a couple of days to a few weeks, usually within a few weeks of starting the statin, and oftentimes will go away within about two weeks of stopping the statin. However, I will point out that these muscle side effects occur only in about seven or 8% of people who take them. And even when they occur, we have lots and lots of strategies that we can use to help get around those, sometimes using a different dose of a different statin, or sometimes using a very low dose of a statin in combination with ezetimibe, which is a statin booster, can give us all of the benefits we need, even with a low dose of a statin. Some people are worried about whether statins go, are going to injure their liver. Statins are so safe on the liver that the Food and Drug Administration does not even require that we monitor liver functions in people taking statins. Now, there have been very rare, what are called idiosyncratic uh, responses in which some people have sustained some liver injury from statins, but those occur basically uh, in a one in more than 100,000 uh, cases. And even when that occurs, if we withdraw it, the problem goes away. So again, be, don't be thinking about worries about your liver when you're on a statin. What about kidney disease? No good evidence that statins worsen kidney disease. Diabetes. In large studies of statins, there's a slight signal to an increased risk for diabetes, but that only tends to occur in those people who are prone to diabetes, those who have strong family histories of diabetes, those who are carrying a lot of weight, those who are eating very poor and unhealthy diets. And if a person were to develop diabetes while taking a statin, the treatment of choice is a statin. And the reason for that is, is that most people with diabetes die of heart attack or stroke. And so the beneficial effects of giving a statin to a person with diabetes far outweighs any risk. There's also been some concern about whether statins can increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, the evidence today tends to suggest that statins reduce the risk because it reduces the risk of, of small strokes that contribute to Alzheimer's disease. So the evidence that statins pr uh, produce Alzheimer's disease is really very tenuous today. And by the way, I should point out to you before I go on that I have no relationships with industry. I have no, I do not take any outside income from anybody. So any information I give you tonight is only based upon what is good for my patients because I don't receive any income outside of what I receive from the University of Miami. What about PCSK9 inhibitors? These are injectable medicines that are given once every two weeks. And they are tremendous in terms of their ability to markedly lower LDL cholesterol, but more importantly, when given in certain high-risk people, they reduce heart attack and stroke risk in combination with statins and can really dramatically lower a uh, person's LDL cholesterol. We're gonna talk in a minute about how safe it is to lower that LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, because some people worry, can I lower it too much? Is it gonna have adverse effects on me? Beautifully, these medicines are very well tolerated. The downside is that they are expensive. And again, most people um, who require statins, can, uh, who require uh, PCSK9 inhibitors can get it covered by their insurance. But again, it's not nearly as um, cost-effective as taking statins or ezetimibe. And so we only reserve it these days for those people who are at extremely high risk and for those who are able to get uh, insurance coverage for the medications. Well. When we talk about uh, using uh, strong statins or statins plus ezetimibe or adding a PCSK9 inhibitor, one of the questions is, how low is it safe to lower your LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol? And so we wrote a paper that we published in the European Heart Journal earlier in 2021, looking at that very topic. And what I'm happy to tell you was, is that our investigations of the topic showed 
that in fact, very low LDL cholesterol that are sometimes attained uh, with the use of, of uh, these medicines, statins, ezetimibe, and PCSK9 inhibitors, actually tend to be extremely safe. Uh, they don't seem to be associated with any major adverse uh, side effects. And one of the great uh, parts is that we showed in one of the studies that the lower the LDL cholesterol was, the lower the risk for heart attack. So again, especially if you've had a heart attack or a fever stent or bypass, you want your LDL cholesterol as low as possible because that seems to be associated with the best outcomes. Now let's talk for a few minutes about what's red hot. And this kind of moves us toward the, I, I think some of the most exciting things that we're doing in prevention these days, looking at coronary artery calcium scoring, looking at earlier use of these PCSK9 inhibitors, not just in people with stable uh, cardiovascular risk, but those who have, who have presented with acute heart attacks or, or strokes or, or, or who are losing their limbs from bad uh, circulation to the legs. Inclisiran, which was just newly, uh, um, newly uh, identified by the FDA as an acceptable drug and now has been approved, long-acting injectable nucleic acid-based therapies, and then artificial intelligence. Let's talk about those for a few minutes and uh, make sure that you understand the newest information on those topics. So first of all, coronary calcium scoring. This test is a five to 10 minute, no IV, no contrast test that people can get to determine if they have hardening of the arteries that supply their heart. It's a beautiful test because it's easy to do. There's no pain involved. It's quick, easy, and gives us very valuable information on cardiovascular risk. The patient lies on that, on that uh, table. They're quickly moved into the CT scanner. Uh, they they um, are asked to uh, just be imaged for five minutes. They're taken out of the CT scanner, and that's the end of the test. Very quick. And the way it works is that there's a chamber that um, that electron beams are shot down, and then they go through the patient, and then they're detected above the patient to create X-ray images. And the X-ray images look something like this. Now, these are three heart scans that are taken from individuals classified at the same heart disease risk based on their risk factors. That is, um, men or women in their middle years who have a couple of risk factors. Their doctor is not sure how much risk they have, and more importantly, whether they would benefit from taking heart prevention medicine. The individual on the left here, and this is a CT scan through the heart, and this is one of the arteries that comes out from the heart. This one has no evidence of white calcific deposits in the walls of the arteries. This doesn't look for blocked arteries. It looks for calcium in the walls of the arteries because calcium in the walls of the arteries precedes the development of blockages or heart attacks. The one in the middle here has a little bit. So that's, that's early evidence of coronary artery hardening. The one on the right has very extensive calcification and plaque buildup. This person is at much higher risk of developing heart attack over time. So again, these people all had the same risk in accordance with their estimated risk in the clinic. But in fact, you couldn't tell which one was which if you just saw the patient. You needed the information that the calcium score gave you. Because in fact, what we now know is that more calcium is associated with more risk. So one of the great values of coronary calcium scoring is it helps you to answer the question, how high is my risk? And more importantly, not only does it tell you how high is my risk, but it tells you, would you likely benefit from being treated with a statin? What we've now discovered is that those individuals who have no coronary calcium that's detectable, in terms, in terms of their risk, if they don't have diabetes, if they're not smokers, and they don't have a family history of early heart disease, in fact, there's very little benefit from treating these patients with statin medications. So again, it helps you determine whether you really do or they really don't require a statin. But it also tells you, if you do have coronary calcium, whether you need more intensive treatment, because people who have a lot more calcium actually need much more intensive preventive treatment to keep them out of trouble. So it's a great way of helping us to know how much risk we are at when we go to see our doctor for the, with the idea of prevention. As I mentioned, it also talks to you about 
whether or not you are likely to benefit. In fact, as it turns out, if you have no detectable coronary calcium, you have to treat many hundreds of patients for a period of six years to prevent one heart attack. So again, that's why this coronary calcium scoring provides such important information to help to guide the prevention-related treatment decisions. There's also another interesting use. We just published a paper uh, in one of our major medical journals. Uh, I've published it with several of my, of my colleagues, addressing the question, what can coronary calcium scoring tell my doctor if I have muscle symptoms while I'm on a statin? And one of the key things to remember is if you don't have a history of a heart attack or you've not had a stroke or you don't have artery blockage in your legs, but a doctor is just giving you a statin to prevent your first heart attack, if it turns out that you start having symptoms that are felt to be related to the statin, a coronary calcium score of zero can help your doctor to know that maybe just lifestyle, diet and exercise is reasonable. Maybe you don't need the statin in the first place. So it's a terrifically helpful test in guiding our treatment. So uh, the University of Miami uh, has, a, uh, has a really nice uh, promotion going on during, during the month of February in Heart Month uh, to find out if you're a candidate for coronary calcium scoring. You may be a candidate if you're a man between the ages of 40 and 65 or a woman between the ages of 50 and 65 and have any of the following risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol or diabetes, or a family history of cardiovascular disease or obesity or smoking. And, and uh, remember, coronary calcium scoring is not to be used in those individuals who already have established coronary artery disease or strokes or blockage in their legs. We already know you need treatment. But if you don't have those and we're trying to prevent them in the first place, coronary calcium scoring, if you're in this age group and if you have these risk factors, might be a very valuable way to determine if you would benefit from a statin, if you don't benefit from a statin, or if you need more intensive treatment to keep you uh, away from the idea of getting a heart attack. And so the university has developed this uh, QR code, uh, which you can take a picture of with your phone camera and get a free risk assessment survey to see if you qualify for calcium scoring. And if you do, it's something you might want to consider in conjunction with advice from your doctor about whether uh, you would benefit from preventive treatments. We're now talking about the use of these PCSK9 inhibitors, the very aggressive LDLS uh, lowering treatments in people who have had strokes or in people who have had recent heart attacks or in people who have recently uh, lost a limb due to bad circulations of the legs, because we know that statins and ezetimibe help to lower LDL cholesterol and reduce cardiovascular risk. But in people who are especially high risk, such as those who have recently had any of these acute uh, arterial events or artery blockage problems, statin and ezetimibe are extremely important. But when you add a PCSK9 inhibitor, not only does it markedly lower the LDL cholesterol, but it also helps reduce blood clotting. So when you put the two of those together, you get reduced atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk more than one would get just from a statin alone. Now, in many people, in fact, in most people, you can reduce your risk enough by using a statin alone or a statin plus a zetamide. But in those very high risk people who are having acute cardiac or stroke or uh, arterial problems in the legs, PCSK9 inhibitors are now being considered for earlier use to, to further prevent events from occurring. Let's now go on to nucleic acid-based therapies. We're now moving into the future, but looking at this fancy looking slide, you'll see that, there's, that there are certain kinds of newer drugs that have been developed that are given by an injection. Some of them are called antisense oligonucleotides and some of them are called RNA, RNA silencers. But basically they are, they've been developed and now can be hooked up to a, to a certain kind of a, of a substance called Galnac, which actually can focus the drug directly on the liver. So it minimizes the exposure of any other body, any other body part to the medication. It takes the blood, uh, takes this, this drug right to the place in the body where it works, which is in the liver. And then you recheck blood studies. And with these antisense oligonucleotides, you can give the drug once a month and get very marked improvement in many, uh, in cholesterol and in many cases in triglycerides. But with these RNA silencers, and this is, this is really exciting now, 
The drug is given by injection initially, given in three months, and then given only twice a year thereafter. And you can get these big 50% reductions in LDL cholesterol without taking other um, medicines. We also recommend though, that when people take these medicines, they continue on their statins, because again, the lower the LDL cholesterol, the better. Well, now we're talking about drugs that one might be able to use every six months to reduce cardiac risk and to reduce LDL cholesterol by 50%. We did have one of these drugs that was just approved called Inclusoran. This new RNA silencer drug uh, was approved in December of 2021. And as I mentioned, it's given by injection at the, at the initiation of treatment at three months and then every six months thereafter causing a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol on top of that, which you get from your statin and uh, ezetimibe. These, these treatments are well tolerated and there are now trials looking at heart attack and stroke outcomes uh, in people receiving this medicine, but it's now been approved by the FDA. Well, we're gonna now uh, go into the final part of this discussion, which is really exciting. It's related to artificial intelligence. This is a field that basically combines computer science, looking at large sets of data to help us to solve problems in a little bit more of an efficient way. So it enables us to take huge amounts of data and use it to the advantage of the patient to reduce uh, risk of various medical problems. And so you see these, you see the fact that artificial intelligence is now used to help us when we interpret certain types of X-ray images to determine whether a person may be at risk. And what I'd like you to do now is to take a look at this. This is a normal CT scan of the chest showing the lungs. Um, let me just get it here. Showing the lungs and the, and the uh, over here in the black areas and a heart in the middle. And this is like a section through the person's chest. So there's lots of information. We often find information about the person's lungs or we found out information about the area between the lungs called the mediastinum. And that's the way that, that uh, chest CTs have traditionally been used. But we also know now that while the majority of chest CT scans are done to assess for abnormalities of the lungs, we now know that we can actually get information on coronary artery calcium from these chest CT scans. And in fact, the presence of coronary artery calcium in these chest CT scans that aren't done for heart reasons, but are just done to look at the lungs for concerns that doctors may have about a patient's lungs, we now know that we can identify coronary calcium in these chest CT scans, and, and that can help people to be identified who didn't even suspect that they might have heart trouble. So what we decided to do was to determine how often this was reported and quantified at University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital. I want to mention to you that although this has been recognized, it's done in very few places throughout the country. Uh, it's just something that, that radiologists, the doctors who read the x-rays don't routinely do. So uh, we base this on the fact that it's not that difficult for radiologists to identify whether a person has no coronary calcium, whether they have mild coronary calcium, as you see here, whether they have moderate coronary calcium or even severe coronary calcium on a chest CT scan. So what we did was we looked at a group of 298 patients uh, who had had uh, chest CT scans, and we actually had our radiology experts take a look at how often coronary calcium was reported in those, in those studies. How many times did the radiologist actually put comments on coronary calcium in the conclusion of the report. And although in many cases, uh, the radiologist noted the presence of coronary calcium, sometimes moderate, even severe coronary calcium, when you look at coronary calcium reported in the conclusion of the report, it was hardly ever reported. And so we said, we've got to do something at University of Miami to try to remind radiologists and try to remain clinicians that there's valuable information on coronary calcium in, in, uh, on chest CT scans. So what we did was we undertook a, a quality improvement project at the University of Miami that enabled us to more frequently report coronary calcium on, on non-cardiac chest CT scans. So we assessed the frequency of reporting and we found it was underreported. 
We then undertook a program to educate our attending physicians and residents about how important it was to report this. And we created new reporting templates that actually required radiologists to report on coronary calcium. We are now in the process of reassessing the frequency of coronary artery calcium reporting. And most excitingly now, we are now, we have, we are now one of four institutions in the United States that has actually integrated artificial intelligence to actually help to analyze these chest CT scans so that where it used to take radiologists roughly five minutes to assess and comment on the amount of coronary calcium on a chest CT scan, using these new artificial intelligence-based technologies that we now are just now integrating into University of Miami Hospital. And we are one of four institutions, University, um, University of Stanford, University of Southern California, Mayo Clinic, and us, and that's it. We are now using uh, artificial intelligence-based identification of coronary calcium to identify calcium in people who are at unsuspected high risk and get those people on appropriate preventive treatments. So to summarize then, in heart disease prevention in 2022, what's hot? What's hot is, with regard to your eating and exercise habits, eat in a heart healthy way and exercise regularly. We want you to be as aware as, as possible of the right foods to eat and that you undertake regular cardiovascular exercise. With regard to risk, be sure that your risk is accurately assessed uh, and be sure that your doctors are recommending treatments that have been shown to reduce risk. Be on the lookout for newer treatments, newer technologies that will help to identify risk earlier. And then ask about the potential use of newer preventive treatments to provide more protection as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Oringer. Uh, wow, so much there, uh, jam-packed with information. Uh, and I will remind the participants uh, with us tonight, the hundreds of people who are with us tonight, hanging on to uh, all, your, or all your wisdom because it really was eye-opening, you know, things that we, I think, all have learned that there will be a link with, to this video about a week afterwards that people are going to receive, okay? Now, uh, we are gonna go to the bottom of the hour, 7.30, so we're gonna try and get through these as quickly as possible, Dr. Oringer. So put on your speed skates and let's get to these okay, questions because there are, there are a lot. First one, how important are small particles in the blood? Is it a problem to have an LDL at 35 but still have small particles in the moderate range? This is a patient with a strict heart healthy diet taking 40 milligrams of Crestor. Okay, so the question is, first of all, what about the size of particles? What we've, what we've determined is that the greatest risk is related to the number of particles you have, not the size of your particles. Too many particles of LDL, whether they're big or small, increase risk. There are some data suggesting that small dense LDL particles provide a little bit more cardiovascular risk but the greatest risk is associated with the greatest number of particles. So a person who has an LDL cholesterol of 35, even if they're small particles, is generally sitting pretty in a pretty good place because they're, they're, uh, the LDL cholesterol, which, which goes along with risk, is generally, um, uh, risk there is generally very, very low. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a good one as well. I follow a low-fat diet, but my cholesterol still runs high. Those statins do help. If my cholesterol is hereditary, should I continue to take statins for the rest of my life? And if so, are there any long-term side effects? So the greatest benefit uh, of statins actually occurs in people with the highest cholesterol levels. So for those who have genetically determined high cholesterol levels, uh, you'd, be, you'd be in the best possible shape to take, uh, to take cholesterol lowering treatment that has been shown to reduce risk. So statins, ezetimibe, and when necessary, PCSK9 inhibitors are the best treatments available for this kind of problem. So answer your question, absolutely. If you have a very high cholesterol level, um, you need the best of, of dietary and exercise therapy and the best of medicine. Continuing on so we can cover as many as possible. We have a, a bunch to get through. I'm 69 years old with a family history of cardiovascular events. Eight years ago, I had a zero score for a calcium test. Do I need to do the test again? This was eight okay. years ago. So I love that question because in fact, older people who have uh, coronary calcium scores of zero tend to uh, be defined as those who have relatively low cardiovascular risk. And if you have a coronary calcium score of 
zero in your early 60s, it would be nice to repeat it once again when you hit the age of 70. But if you have a coronary calcium score of zero when you're 70, have a great day because you're not going to get cardiovascular disease. It's, uh, it's going to be something else that gets you. So make sure you do your all your all your other screening uh, tests, but it's not going to be cardiovascular disease. That's a good way to to remember for all of us. All right, my dad had a high calcium test score, but the doctor said, "Not don't worry because dad has a stent, and it would throw the numbers off." Is that so? Okay, well, the answer is uh, a person who had a stent shouldn't have gotten a coronary calcium score to begin with. We only do coronary calcium scoring in those uh, who have not had established vascular disease, no history of heart attack or stroke or artery blockage in the leg. So please don't be doing coronary calcium scores if you've already had uh, one of those problems because it really doesn't, we already know you need treatment and, and the calcium scoring test doesn't provide any meaningful information. This next question shows that our audience is informed and on top of their health issues. How can there be such wide variations in calcium scores from one coronary artery to another? For example, left main, 0 0.1, left anterior descending, 88.3, left circumflex, 90.2, right coronary, 15.3. Is this common, rare, dangerous? Right. Well, in fact, uh, variability in the deposits of coronary uh, calcium, that is calcium in the walls of the arteries. Again, we're not talking about blockage, we're talking about calcium in the walls, is, is actually very common. And the, the, the place the calcium deposits in the arteries um, may have, um, may be impacted by the geometry of the artery, the way that an artery angulates, more calcium may, may occur at certain angulation points. But in fact, the location of coronary calcium is not particularly important. Uh, because heart attacks don't tend to occur where people have uh, heavy deposits of calcium. The reason that calcium scores are important is because the presence of calcified plaques means that you also have soft plaques. The soft plaques are the ones that are going to crack and cause a heart attack. So in fact, the location of the coronary calcium probably has very, very little impact. It's the amount of plaque that you have that determines your risk. The more total plaque you have, the more your risk. And the quality of the plaque, the soft, the hard, interesting, yeah. fascinating. You don't see you don't see soft plaque in a coronary calcium scoring test. You would only see that on what's called a coronary CT angiogram. But in reality, the coronary calcium tells you key information about how much plaque you have, and uh, it provides enough information that we don't have to be doing coronary CT angiograms on everybody to determine risk. All right, this is the final one that had been sent in advance, and then we're going to go rat tat tat to all the ones that are sitting in our chat box. Controlling my systolic hypertension caused my diastolic to go too low and causes orthostatic hypotension. Are there any new meds for this issue with that whole group of meds that you gave us, Doc? Okay, so um, one of the issues when we're treating blood pressure is to get to that sweet spot where a person's blood pressure is lowered enough to reduce risk, but not so much as to cause them to feel dizzy when they stand up. So this so-called orthostatic hypotension, which is a complaint of, of dizziness or faintness when a person stands up, oftentimes indicates that a person might need to be on a little bit less of their blood pressure medication. So the, the general thing to remember is that uh, in most people, and this is not everyone, but in most people, lower is better in terms of blood pressure. And those who have uh, lower blood pressures are less prone to cardiovascular events but the decision about the exact level of your blood pressure needs to be made in conjunction with your health provider. All right, let's go to the, uh, all the questions that have come in that our fabulous team at UHealth have been fielding for us. I have hypothyroidism, thyroidism, and read that beta blockers are not recommended for persons with thyroid problems. I've experienced strong side effects when taking dilatiazem and metoprolol. What do you recommend? Okay, so hypothyroidism is a disease where there is underactivity of the thyroid gland at the base of the neck, and uh, that can have various effects uh, on, on bodily functions, um, depending upon the, the severity of the thyroid disorder. Uh, one can have a slow heart rate, one can, can feel cold all the time, one can notice reduced energy. Um, it can also be associated with high cholesterol, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, my suspicion is that the that uh, depending upon your heart rate, if your heart rate was very slow to begin with, both diltiazem and a beta blocker slows the heart rate even more. So if you had if you had pretty marked hypothyroidism, one could explain feeling worse 
by the fact that your heart rate was slowed too much. If that's not the case, then there are other reasons that a person can have adverse effects from those medications. But as I mentioned before, um, we tend not to use beta blockers as the first agent for blood pressure. Uh, calcium channel blockers are particularly effective in, in older patients. They're also uh, particularly effective in people who are non-Hispanic black ethnicity. Um, so there are certain ethnic considerations that we, that we think about and certain age considerations we think about in prescribing a blood pressure medication. But in the great majority of cases, blood pressure can be nicely controlled uh, with a combination of diet, exercise, and the right medication. And I will also tell the audience here tonight, the hundreds of people who are tuned in, that uh, they can uh, follow up with this whole conversation to get a, a consult. We're going to put the contact information on the screen so they'll know how to contact you, health, in your office, and, and so forth, because it's hard to do this in, in, a, in a webinar like this. Next question. I have low sodium, 30. Should I restrict certain medicines for high blood pressure and for LDL? So low sodium, I suspect that they were talking about 130, um, oftentimes is, uh, there are lots and lots of reasons for low sodium, but, but probably the most common that we encounter clinically is, is that some of the diuretics that are used for high blood pressure can cause some low sodium. Although again, there are lots of other reasons for low sodium. But when a person has uh, low sodium, which is called hyponatremia, um, one of the issues that we always recommend is that you take a look at your medications because sometimes there are certain medications which if you alter can help to get rid of that. Um, so when a person is confronted with that, they've really got to check with their doctor to, to determine if it is a medication that's causing it or if there's another medical metabolic condition that's causing the low sodium. All right, now you talked about uh, aspirin a great deal as a prevention for a heart attack, depending on the profile of the patient. Here's a specific question. What about low dose aspirin for those who have had a TIA or TIE, but not a full-blown stroke? Yes, uh, so a TIA represents what's called a transient ischemic attack. And uh, the, it is general consensus that, that aspirin is beneficial in people who have had a transient ischemic attack. So a TIA or a stroke, or even those who have been documented to have narrowing of the arteries in their neck of uh, particularly 50% or more, aspirin therapy is felt to be beneficial in terms of reducing their risk of stroke. The biggest worry that most people have is, is a stroke. You don't want to be paralyzed. You don't want to be unable to speak or communicate. You want to, don't want to have to be dependent on others. So simple measures, inexpensive generic treatments, aspirin, statins, big prevention against these episodes but again, remember, primary prevention, aspirin doesn't seem to help. That yeah. can help in primary prevention, that is preventing the first heart attack. So again, that's a discussion you have to have with your healthcare provider who can help you decide if it makes sense for you. The mighty aspirin still rules in, in many cases, right, Doc? How can one have an APOB level done? Please explain if it's an adequate surrogate measure of coronary heart disease risk. Great question. ApoB is, stands for apolipoprotein B. It's a way of getting an idea of how many um, so-called atherogenic particles, that is particles that promote cardiovascular risk are present in the body. We generally don't get those except in selected people with high triglyceride levels. Uh, that's another type of fat in the blood. Uh, and when those are high, that increases, that, that's associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But there is no blood test that compares to a coronary calcium scan because a coronary calcium scan actually synthesizes all the risk factors, cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, genetics, and it lets you know if you have the disease that the doctor is trying to prevent. And it tells you how much of it you have. All right, here's a question on Centrum Silver Vitamin. What's your point of view of that? We already heard you say that certain vitamins, it just gives you expensive urine. Um, and your point of view on taking amlodipine besolate for high blood pressure? Well, so amlodipine, amlodipine is, is one of the best available blood pressure medications. It's generic. It's generally well tolerated. You don't have to do repeated blood studies to look at it and when given in the, to look at its effectiveness. And when given in a dose of around five milligrams a day, which is the usual starting dose for that medicine, it is, it is uh, remarkably effective in so many patients older patients, African-American patients, younger patients, uh, and doesn't require regular or routine blood follow-up. So it's a really nice 
blood pressure medication. And the Centrum Silver? Um, no evidence of benefit. Okay. Except for the people who make Centrum Silver or sell it. Yes. <laughs> but no, no, no benefit. All right. What do you think of taking the probiotic lactobacillus Ritori 30242? This sounds like someone who's in the know to lower LDL clinical study evidence. The LDL of this person is 120, HDL of 85, cholesterol 230, triglycerides 54, and has a family history of heart disease. Okay, so um, there's really no good evidence that probiotics have, have a beneficial effect on LDL cholesterol. Um, uh, but I think that there's something very important in that person's uh, blood profile that I wanna mention. And that is, you mentioned that the HDL cholesterol is 85? Yeah. Okay. So we used to think that if a person had a high level of the bad cholesterol, the LDL, but also had a high level of the good cholesterol, that they were protected. We've now become, we've now recognized that although high levels of HDL cholesterol give us information in large populations of people as a protective effect, in a given patient, high HDL, medium HDL, or low HDL, you can't tell whether that person's at increased risk based on the HDL alone. And we don't know whether any treatments that affect HDL increase cardiovascular risk. The money is with LDL and with triglycerides. So we really, we used to think, I have a high HDL, I'm good, I'm protected. Not so much. No, we don't Excellent. know. We don't know one way or the other in any given individual patient. More eye-opening info. Should someone with stents get a coronary calcium score? I think you already said this. No. Yes, the answer is no. Yeah. Anybody no. with established vascular disease heart attacks, strokes, stents, bypass, um, uh, and or blockage in the legs. You don't need a coronary calcium score because in fact, we already know you need aggressive preventive treatment. Exactly. Here's a super interesting one, Dr. Oringer. How can I differentiate between fibromyalgia and muscle side effects of statins? Wonderful question. That is, that's really one of the key questions that we have to deal with in our, in our lipid clinic, for example. We have people who have pre-existing muscle issues who may require a statin. And the answer is, the answer is sometimes people have very difficult muscle-related symptoms that we can't be sure if they're from the statin or not. Um, people don't get, statin-associated pains are not pain in your elbow or pain in your knee or pain in one shoulder uh, or generally low back pain. These are not traditional statin-related symptoms. Um, fibromyalgia, people have point tenderness in various locations. You don't get that from a statin. So again, um, you have to work with your clinician who's, who's familiar with you know, the way to differentiate these different types of muscle symptoms. And sometimes it's a question, if a, uh, if a person has had a worsening of their symptoms, you're not sure if that's related to their fibromyalgia or a statin they're on. And sometimes it really relates to a great uh, uh, doctor-patient relationship to kind of uh, ferret this out to decide what, what is what and what you can do to best mitigate it. I'm going to uh, choose this last question and sort of frame it a little differently because this person is asking about whether they should give nitroglycerin for, to someone having a heart attack. I'm, I'm going to take a little further. We've always heard, keep that aspirin in your pocket. And if you are witnessing someone who you suspect to be having a heart attack be before 911 and the paramedics get there, is that something you should do? Okay, well, so so if you think that someone thinks that they may be having a heart attack, chewing a couple of 325 aspirins is, is or, even, or even taking four of your 81 milligram aspirin tablets and chewing them gets that into your system rapidly and it, and it certainly can make sense. But the problem with giving nitroglycerin uh, is that there are certain types of heart attacks that are associated with low blood pressure. Uh, and if you give a person a nitroglycerin, uh, or, or a person whose heart size is normal to begin with, you give a nitroglycerin, you can actually drop their blood pressure substantially and may actually harm them. So I would leave that decision to the paramedics. Yeah, and the same thing with a lot of the, uh, the automatic defibrillators that are in malls and in places like that. It, it's a hard decision to make. It's, it's something that you really are not, you're sort of diagnosing a patient without having any medical background. That, that would also be tricky, I would suspect. Well, that can be a very scary uh, situation, but there are there are courses in in uh, lay CPR where we can learn how to identify a person who's who's actually having a cardiac arrest. We look we look we take a look at the patient. We see if they're responding. Are they breathing? Do they have any? Do they have a pulse? 
Uh, first thing we do is we, we call for help. We say, please go ahead and get, uh, if there's a defibrillator around, let's get it. We check the patient and if necessary, uh, defibrillator should be used. On the other hand, sometimes the person's breathing okay and their pulse is okay. And you just need to, to, uh, to you know, you can call for help, but those people just need to be supported until professional help comes or someone who's familiar with CPR is available on the scene. Quite right. Um, and we're gonna close with this question about the calcium screening because so many people are asking, what is the criteria? Do they meet the criteria? So let's put that up on the screen right now, Lindy. Uh, let's repeat and people can see the QR code so that they can get the free risk assessment again, Dr. Oringer. Okay, so the main thing to remember is that coronary calcium scoring is done to determine in people who have not had a heart attack, who have not had a bypass, who have not had a stent, who haven't had a stroke, who haven't had blocked arteries in the legs, whether you actually can benefit from preventive treatment. So candidates are people who are men age 40 to 65, women age 50 to 65, who have had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, have a history of diabetes, family history of cardiovascular disease, obese smokers. Those people can benefit from knowing what their calcium score is so that their doctor can determine if they're gonna benefit from taking preventive treatments. And also if they have coronary calcium, whether more aggressive preventive treatments are warranted. So scanning this QR code can help you uh, to determine if you actually qualify for uh, this, I guess it's $25 a month at the university this month uh, to get this test done. Uh, and I think it, it can be extremely useful, particularly uh, for those who aren't sure if they should really receive these preventive treatments. Yeah, because as we said at the beginning, the whole idea is prevention. To be treating disease is already a little late. Yes, we can make a difference with all the incredible medicines that are on the market now, but the idea is to prevent getting sick. So uh, Dr. Oringer, this has been, like, like I said, eye-opening. Uh, I learn all the time. You've educated us. You've, you've given us uh, important information for us to live by and live longer by. Uh, I want to so, give you one final, you. One, one final Please. point I want to bring up. Even if you've already had these conditions, heart attack, stent, bypass, blocked arteries in the legs, you also need aggressive prevention. So that's called secondary prevention. That's a lot of what I do as well. That is people who've already had these events, in many cases with careful attention to diet and exercise and the right medications, you can turn the activity of this disease off. You can turn it off cold. And many people who were very worried that they were gonna be in trouble have been maintained in very good health for many, many years when they, when they use the right preventive treatments. So please don't forget that prevention has an extremely important role, even if you've already had one of these conditions. Thank you so much, for Dr. Oringer, for inspiring us and making us feel that we can make a difference because we, in fact, do have control in, in our hands. And thank God we're alive in the 21st century with all this incredible treatment. Um, thank you all, by the way, for being such a great audience, great questions, super interactive. Uh, and Dr. Oringer, again, you're a rock star. Thanks so much thank for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, re remember everyone that we at the University of Miami Health System are grateful for you. We're here to care for you. Please remember to visit umiamihealth.org or call 305-243-5554 um, so that you can make an appointment in person, virtual, our experts are here. And please, fill out the, the survey at the end, give us feedback, suggest other topics. We wish you a great night. We hope that you stay safe. Happy Heart Month. Happy Month of Love. And uh, we'll see you again. Good night. Good night.